He would obviously face the same fate as poor Bradley Manning, who languishes somewhere in a military prison after being treated with total inhumanity verging on torture. Our hearts go out to Bradley Manning, who has been forgotten by many as he awaits trial in who knows what sort of conditions. Like Bradley Manning, if Julian Assange was sent to the United States, he could face not only humiliation and degradation, but he could face life in prison or the death penalty, a fate that is unbelievable and totally unacceptable. Last time I spoke out in support of Assange, I said that I had concerns that he would be arrested the moment he tried to leave the Ecuadorian embassy, that I had not considered how heavy-handed the British police would be and how threatening their behaviour outside the embassy would become. The blatant intimidation of friendly diplomats is inexcusable when we consider the fact that Assange has not formally been charged with any serious crime and has already spent two years under house arrest as he tried to work through the legal system as requested. But we all know that there is no justice when someone takes on the entrenched halls of power and the vengeance of the United States of America. The British police are spending at least £50,000 a day to intimidate the embassy and Assange supporters. This is a sum that shows how serious the intent to extradite Assange really is and how ridiculous all the claims of binding obligations really are. Meanwhile, across the Atlantic, in Obama's headquarters in Oakland, California, six protesters have been arrested for holding a sit-in to protest the events in London. The whole thing is heading inexorably to a Shakespearean tragedy, towards a climax that is frightening in its possibilities. Police guard the roof and the lift of the embassy building, while heat detectors are on the site to stop any attempt to sneak him out in furniture, bags, or any other way they can think of. Right. My friends and comrades, we are coming to the point in this drama where only consistent, extended, and high-level campaigning can help this man who shone a light into the dark corners of government and the power elite. We must use every means at our disposal to try and support Julian Assange in this, his darkest hour. We're seeing the incredible reach of American power and it is shocking and it bodes ill for the future of speech, free speech and the right to speak out in the West. Finally, I would also like to acknowledge the injustice that is taking place in Russia where all girl punk band Pussy Riot are facing up to three years in jail for performing in a cathedral. My friends, we are going backwards and if we do not defend the courageous actions of people like these who say no to government domination and secrecy, we will find ourselves living in a world akin to that described in 1984. The Greens support Julian Assange and we say to the Australian government, stop being a US puppet and offer support and sanctuary to one of our own citizens, to someone who will go down in history as a voice for freedom and transparency. Let Julian go. Stop blockading the Ecuadorian embassy and arresting supporters and end the machinations of American intimidation and domination. Thank you. Thanks, Irene. I'd, like, I'd now like to introduce to you Professor Jake Lynch from the Centre for Peace and Conflict Studies at Sydney University. There is a country where pre-trial hearings in criminal cases are routinely held in secret, thus depriving the accused of the safeguard of public scrutiny 
of judicial deliberations and the quality of evidence. In this country, people on remand are routinely held in ordinary prisons and they are kept incommunicado from their families, they are deprived of the opportunity for exercise and when this country received a visit from the Committee to Protect for the Prevention of Torture, most of them told investigators they believed this treatment was to break their resistance and induce them to admit to offences they had not committed. So where, I hear you ask, is this country? Is it perhaps Ecuador? No. Syria? No. Actually, Sweden. And this was a concern raised in an official report on the state of human rights in that country, and the author of the official report was the US State Department in the year 2010. Now, of course, for the rights of defendants to be hidden behind a veil of secrecy, as it is in Sweden, is a problem when viewed through the lens of human rights. But it is a positive asset if you are engaged in a conspiracy to spirit Julian Assange into decades of torture in a privately run supermax prison in Maryland. And perhaps that is why there is such a strong official effort to wrest him from the judicial system of the United Kingdom, where such civil rights are still adequately protected, only, I might add, because attempts to tamper with them tend to run into serious political resistance and get him to Sweden instead. Uh, indeed, um, those two views of that situation are a good shorthand for two world views. We might call them the WikiLeaks view and the Willie Hague view. Yes, the, the Foreign Secretary, denizen of the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, uh, the man who is responsible for your well-being here in Australia, you know, decades after we set you free. Well, William Hague, of course, made his name uh, with a speech to the conference of the British Conservative Party at the age of 16, earning him the name Tory Boy. Uh, later, he told a journalist that uh, when he was doing his, his vacation work during his student days with his father's firm of brewers, uh, he was partial to a tipple, and, and indeed he would uh, knock back several pints of beer a day. Actually, it transpired later that the strongest fluid to have passed his lips was dandelion and burdock, whereupon he became known as Billy Fizz. So there's a, there's a WikiLeaks view and there's a Billy Fizz view. And how fascinating that the two have been so prominent recently in the country I refer to as the Old Sod. Yes, uh, Britain, uh, which wowed the watching world uh, with Danny Boyle's masterpiece, the opening ceremony of the Olympic Games, showcasing social achievements like the National Health Service and our glorious popular culture, uh, and succeeding in drawing forth another signature sound of an English summer, the annoying whine of the knuckle-dragging Tory right, who, 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 who labelled it as lefty multicultural crap. Well, that's, that's the background William Hague comes from. And, and sadly, that version of the United Kingdom still holds sway in the corridors of the establishment. And how typical that it should slyly attempt to stick in the knife in its diplomatic communications, not in the full glare of publicity in London, but thousands of miles away in Quito, in a sneaky little message sent to the Ecuadorian Foreign Ministry, doubtless hoping to minimise the fallout and to try to stop people from finding out about it. Well, luckily, the Ecuadorian Foreign Minister was a bit quicker on his feet than Willie and his men had bargained for. And, and that's why we are, as they say, where we are. Now, in the battle between these two worldviews, the human rights view, the view that takes an optimistic stance on human nature, the view that is in favour of progress and social justice as embodied in the National Health Service, and then the other view, the lump and establishment view, which is prepared to ride roughshod over people's rights and freedoms. All it takes for the former to win out over the latter is the light of information. 
And that is the real significance of the achievements of WikiLeaks and Julian Assange. And that, of course, is why establishments in Canberra, Washington, London, Stockholm, many other places want to see that light turned out. So I think it's worth just reminding ourselves of what we know, thanks to WikiLeaks, and how grateful we can be about it. Uh, because WikiLeaks has been drawing attention, of course, and equipping us to perceive the gap between the line we are told about what governments are doing and what is really going on behind the scenes. You know, um, in some of my research recently, um, I've been playing people different versions of a news story about Israel and the Palestinians. And it's been yawn-inducing. Everybody has told us, oh, we've seen this so many times before. The only thing that makes people wake up is when they see a map of the amazing disappearing Palestine, showing, showing how the territory available to Palestinians has been shrunken, divided and reticulated over decades of Israeli settlement expansion. So why is that so unfamiliar? Why does that make people sit up and take notice? It's because they've never seen it on television before. And why have they never seen it on television before? It's because of the exertion of power on behalf of the Israeli state, a key ally, of course, of Washington and London. Now, all these depredations against the Palestinians are routinely justified by Israel and by the pro-Israeli lobby here, I might add, as essential to Israel's security. And they include the ongoing siege of Gaza, whereby the people of Gaza are deprived of, of the materials they need to rebuild schools and hospitals after the attack on them by the Israeli military, the so-called Operation Cast Lead. Just recently, a UN report found that drinking water in Gaza is now unsafe as a result. Now, now Israel says this siege is imposed in order to safeguard its own security. That's the line it gives the rest of us. But we know from WikiLeaks that is in fact a lie. Because behind the scenes, the American ambassador in Tel Aviv was being told the purpose of that siege is to keep the economy of Gaza on the brink of collapse. It is, in other words, a collective punishment. And under Article 33 of the Fourth Geneva Convention, which is supposed to safeguard non-competence in conflict, that is therefore a war crime. Now that's not the only war crime that WikiLeaks has exposed. It has exposed, for example, how President Rajapaksa of Sri Lanka uh, was informed by the US ambassador with satellite pictures to back it up that his armed forces were bombing civilian areas in spite of his orders to them to desist and the assurances he had given the outside world. And yet, for two full weeks after that occasion, after that briefing, the bombing continued, civilians continued to be killed in their thousands, and by command responsibility, that makes that a war crime as well. So why, you might ask, is the International Criminal Court, the ICC, that was so keen to swing in with indictments against Colonel Gaddafi and his confreres, where is the ICC in its action over the war crimes well attested against the President of Sri Lanka? It's by the information supplied by WikiLeaks that we can begin to see the disposition of power in the world around us. It reminds me of nothing so much as a piece of appropriately, you may think, English wisdom uh, from the book Howard's End by E.M. Forster, only connect. Julian is enabling us to connect. That's what they don't like. That's why we must see that he remains a free man. Thank you, Jake, for another great speech. I'd now, I'd now like to introduce David Shoebridge, New South Wales Greens MP. Thanks, David. Thanks, Jan. And thank you all for coming out here to stand before the British Consulate in Sydney and make one simple demand. Leave Julian Assange alone. <laughs> Just yesterday, we saw one government stand up for an Australian citizen. We saw one government take the step 
and recognise that an Australian citizen in clear and imminent peril of being extradited to the United States for an extraordinary, unjust uh, and, and grossly inhumane process, we saw one government stand up for this Australian citizen. And it was not our government. It was the Ecuadorian government. The Ecuadorian government deserves our thanks. And it deserves the thanks not just of Julian Assange, a citizen of Australia, but it deserves the thanks of citizens from across the globe for standing up to give, to give refuge to a man and, uh, and a symbol for openness on this planet. Because let's be clear why it is that the Ecuadorian embassy in the United Kingdom is surrounded by British police. Let's be clear why it is our government is saying nothing about one of our citizens surrounded in those circumstances. It's because of what WikiLeaks has told the world. It's because WikiLeaks, through showing things such as that appalling collateral damage video, has shown for the first time ever to people in their lounge room what the true and brutal cost of America's war in Iraq, America's war in Afghanistan, which our government has been a willing and willing and constant supporter of. It's shown the real face of that war. It is ugly, it is brutal, and it is indiscriminate death to citizens in those countries. The UK government doesn't like hearing about it. The Australian government doesn't like hearing about it. And of course, the government that's pulling all the strings, the United States government, doesn't want to hear about it. That's why there are police surrounding Julian Assange today, and we should call it for what it is, an attempt to silence the citizens of the world who for the first time were getting an insight into the ugly decision-making in the halls of Washington, Canberra and London. Yeah. Rather remarkably, when the Ecuadorian government was assessing Julian Assange's refugee claim, his asylum claim, there was one box they had to tick under the convention. They had to ask themselves, was Julian Assange's home country, the country of his own nationality, taking any steps to protect him from the peril he was facing? And let's be clear, they looked at what Australia had done and they acknowledged under the Geneva Conventions that the Australian government was failing to protect Julian Assange. And that is why Ecuador had to act. We've seen nothing but silence from the Foreign Minister Bob Carr when it comes to standing up for a citizen. How remarkable is that any one of us would expect our Foreign Minister to stand up and protect us if we were seeking consulate protection surrounded by police. But rather remarkably, Julian Assange does not get that protection. Today we're outside the British consulate calling on the British government to withdraw the police withdraw the threats from the Ecuadorian consulate and leave Julian Assange at least, at least to have the removed from the threat of imminent violence for doing nothing other than making a claim for asylum from a friendly country. We had the quite remarkable situation of one friendly country, the Ecuadorian, the Ecuador, Ecuador, granting asylum to an Australian citizen one would think a friendly country to the United Kingdom, yet still being surrounded by troops and having the threat blind to the Vienna Convention that they will break into the Ecuadorian Embassy and physically and violently remove Julian Assange. And what does our government say? Not one word. Well, shame on our government. We will continue, whether it's in rallies like this in, in Sydney, Australia, whether it's rallies in Washington, whether it's those brave people who've stood up in the United Kingdom, brave UK citizens who've stood up for the rights of Julian Assange, we will continue to highlight the inaction of the Australian government. We'll call for protection of Julian Assange and we make the continuing demand. We want a new, a new era of transparency. We want to see what decisions are being made by our governments. And we want WikiLeaks and that project of global openness to continue to be at the forefront of it. Thank you all for coming. WikiLeaks free speech, hands off WikiLeaks! We demand free speech, hands off WikiLeaks!
Okay, now I'd like to call Jim McElroy from the Latin American Social Forum to speak. Thank you very much. The Latin American Social Forum represents um, Latin American communities and others in Sydney who are campaigning in support of uh, people's movements in Latin America. And I'd like to ask the question straight off. Why Ecuador? Why is it Ecuador that stood up and taken this stand in support of Julian Assange? I think the answer is very clear. It is not, it, it is no accident that it's Ecuador. It's no accident that it's one of those countries in Latin America which is standing up and carrying out people's movements in support of their own people in the international rights. When the British government threatened to actually invade the Ecuadorian embassy in Britain, the ambassador uh, said, the age of colonialism is over. Britain has to realize this. You, you can't just invade small countries anymore. Well, that's true in principle, but unfortunately they keep continuing to do it. And I think that's one of the important things I want to stress here today. That is that we should realize that Ecuador has taken a very courageous stand here. Something we should support. And we need to, and I'd like to say that we should ta actually take a vote here, right here and now of support and encouragement of the Ecuadorian government, the Ecuadorian embassy for their courageous stand. Always in favor of that. We should pass that on to the Ecuadorian embassy. I think we should pass that to the Ecuadorian ambassador in Australia. The decision taken by Ecuador, a long statement was presented by Richard Patino, who's the um, Foreign Minister of Ecuador. They went through this thing quite exhaustively. They looked at all the ins and outs of the situation and they engaged in long-standing discussions with the government of Sweden, the government of Britain, uh, I'm not sure to what extent the government of Australia, they seem to have taken a totally hands-off attitude, uh, actually backed off and really betrayed their own citizen, that's, that's another point out of all this and also with the government of the United States to try and get a guarantee that if Assange was extradited to Sweden, he wouldn't be on extradited to the United States. And no such guarantee has been given. And no such guarantee has been given by any of the governments, which would be a simple way, in which case Assange could, if a guarantee was given, Assange could go to Sweden and answer the, the alleged charges that are being put up. Now, I won't speak at length on this, I just want to stress to people, please go and investigate what's happening in Latin America. That This has brought Ecuador right to the centre of world attention. Ecuador, a little country, we used to probably save stamps from Ecuador. That's probably all we, we knew about Ecuador in the old days. Have a look what's happening in Ecuador. I was absolutely disgusted when I heard the ABC AM program running State Department rubbish about how the, uh, the media in Ecuador is under attack. Go and check it out. What's happening is there's right-wing media that make Murdoch look like a Sunday school preacher attacking these governments. I, I myself and some others are going to Venezuela in two weeks to attend a brigade to support the presidential elections of President Chavez. This is really important what's happening in Latin America and we can see how it affects the world situation right here and now with Julian Assange. These governments are going to be under attack. And I'll finish by saying we have to be vigilant because the CIA and the United States will launch an attack on Ecuador. You can be sure about it. They are going to increase their attempts to undermine Ecuador. We've already seen recently a progressive government in Paraguay overthrown. And prior to that, Honduras, we need to be vigilant about this. Let's not kid ourselves about this. There will be reprisals against the government of Ecuador. There will be attempts to undermine that government there will be attempts to change the situation. So let us escalate our support for Julian Assange and let us escalate our support for the Latin American revolutions which are changing the situation for the people of those countries and excluding the old colonialism and the new colonialism. That's why a government like Correa's in Ecuador can take this stand. That is no accident at all. We must stand up and be ready to defend the government of Ecuador as they come under more and more pressure in this situation. So viva Julian Assange and viva President Correa of Ecuador and viva the Latin American Revolution. Thank you.
Thanks, Jim. And now the last speaker is Mark Goodcamp from the Refugee Activist, um, Refugee Activist from Refugee Action Coalition. Thanks, Mark. Thanks a lot for inviting uh, me along to speak today. First, I also want to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. Just metres from here, when the first fleet arrived, 26th of January, 1788, and in doing so, make the link to Ecuador. Why is it that Rafael Correa is in power today? It's partly because of a mass movement on the streets of Ecuador, led by the indigenous people of Ecuador against the policies of dispossession and against the policies of neoliberalism imposed by the great empire just to the north of Ecuador. And I think it's worth quoting again. Jim just quoted a little bit about the foreign minister of Ecuador's um, speech yesterday in granting asylum. I mean, it was on the front page of the Herald today. He said, the Ecuadorian government, loyal to its tradition to protect those who seek refuge with us, have decided to grant diplomatic asylum to Mr. Assange because of the fears expressed by Mr. Assange. And this isn't just a one-off for Ecuador. I know that, for example, they hold 56,000 Colombian refugees. Of course, Colombia, the country which receives the most foreign aid from the United States in the whole of Latin America, and which has the dubious records for the most number of trade unionists murdered year on year on year. That's who America's allies are in Latin America. And in, doing, and in quoting the Foreign Minister of Ecuador, I want to contrast their position in granting Julian Assange asylum and the Colombian refugees asylum to the attitude of the Australian government towards refugees trying to seek protection in this country. The Australian government, the British government, the US government like to go around the world and lecture other countries about human rights. Well, I think the Ecuadorian government has given a lesson well and truly to those countries who declare themselves to be bastions of freedom around the globe. And we saw the sickening scenes in the parliament this week. The sickening scenes of the Australian government and the Australian opposition, with the honourable exception of the Greens members of the of parliament, doing everything they can, absolutely everything they can to stop people trying to get to this country who are fleeing countries like Afghanistan, countries like Iraq, things which Julian Assange has opened the, opened the lid on as to why people are fleeing those countries in the first place and the contribution that Western countries have made towards the outpouring of refugees from those countries in the first place. And I also want to point out one of the other revelations early on with WikiLeaks. We hear Tony Abbott all the time go on about stopping the boats. We hear it all the time, but actually, in secret, they pop the champagne corks every time a boat comes because they, in their vindictive, vicious way, want to demonise asylum seekers coming here. And Julian Assange exposed that. It's a shame that that has faded from public memory, but it's something that we have to remember every time they ramp up the rhetoric against asylum seekers and refugees coming to this country. We saw it again yesterday. Initially, lies from the Australian Minister Jason Clare, the Home Affairs Minister, saying that a group of asylum seekers had attacked the crew on a boat. Ironically, a boat which is the sister ship to the Tampa from 12 years ago, from 11 years ago. When the captain, an honourable man obviously, came out and said, no, 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 the asylum seekers didn't violently attack us. This did not stop Scott Morrison and Tony Abbott trying to say that these asylum seekers should be tried for piracy under the Crimes Act. It's those people, it's Scott Morrison, it's Tony Abbott, it's Chris Bowen, it's Julia Gillard who should be tried yeah. under, under, under the legal system in this country for their crimes against human rights and their crimes against refugees. I want to quote, uh, there's a man who's just put out a brilliant book called Reluctant Rescuers, which shows the horrendous, the horrendous delays 
in rescuing boats that are trying to come here. And we only hope that WikiLeaks will blow open the secret communications in the Australian government about this kind of thing so that people can see the reality. And Tony Kevin says, actually, for all their crocodile tears about deaths at sea and safety at sea, that actually there's a bipartisan approach known as wishful thinking. Wishful thinking. Because it's only the fact when the boats go down that they can actually push this agenda in the way that they have over the last couple of months to a situation where we've got the same horrible hell holes being opened up as we speak, the Australian military being sent over to reopen the hell holes in Nauru and Manus Island as we speak, as we speak, no expense spared when it comes to deterring asylum seekers when actually increasing the quota wouldn't cost that much and certainly offering protection to Julian Assange would cost very, very little financially for them. I guess the other link I want to make between WikiLeaks and Julian Assange is the whole question of the Arab Spring and the Arab Spring uprisings because we know that many of the refugees currently come and try to get to the West and being deterred whether it's Australia, Britain, the US. We know that many of them have come from those countries. But we know that the Tunisian revolution partly, of course the people themselves carried it out, but it was the information from WikiLeaks exposing the lavish lifestyles and the corruption of their corrupt dictator Ben Ali which forced them, which, which compelled and propelled them onto the streets to get rid of that decades old dictator. Similarly, information of, of, in Bahrain about you know, arms coming in from the US exposed by WikiLeaks. More recently, for all the talk from the West about the human rights atrocities of Bashar al-Assad in Syria, we know that Western corporations and Western governments have continued to invest and continue to make money out of their relationship with that dictatorship. So, I guess just in, in winding up, you know, in those countries they have shown what the alternative is, partly inspired by Julian Assange and WikiLeaks, they have taken things into their own hands and tried to bring in a system for themselves, a, a, a revolution for themselves, so that people would never have to flee to seek refugee status in the, in the, in the first place in the future. And I guess the, what, we have to, what we have to hope for is that, you know, freedom for Julian Assange and, and freedom for the people around the world so that we can live in a global society. We can live in a global society where there isn't the rank hypocrisy of the West on human rights and where people, you know, don't live in fear every day of their lives, don't live in fear, and we can live in a truly global community. Thanks very much. We've got a surprise two more speakers and we've got a surprise speaker. We're just waiting to see if he'll agree to speak. Mamdou Habib is here and he would like to speak. Actually, I'm feeling very sorry for Australian people. We have a very impressed government. We have lived in a, a criminal government. Australian government is really criminal. And Australian citizens, they have no safety anymore. Sure. We should do like Syria and Egypt. We should start doing this, change this government. And we demolish it from the beginning. We have to get new people, honest, to take care of the citizens. Yeah. Uh, my understanding, and my understanding, I, I am really live in, in this situation. And I feel for this man. I'm, I not really feel I live, I, I live with him every day and I'm embarrassed. Today I see 100 or 200 people stand up for, for him, but we should be there to take him out and bring him back in Australia. Yeah. We should be in England, bring this man to his home. Yeah. He, I can see what, what reason for this man to be in jail or this reason and is this government is a corrupt and all the reason because he releasing information we should know about it 
Every Australian citizen should be aware of what's going on around the world. What Australians are doing behind the wall, behind these offices. Australian government, until today, they say they have nothing to do with Habib. Believe me or not, I have my court case start in Egypt. Egyptian government deny completely I was there. I don't know who take me. Australian government, even the the investigator, they say Mrs. Vivia Thomason for from an Inspector General Office and the Attorney General Office and the same people they was kidnapped me, the same people tried to settle the case with me. And the same people say we never apology for Habib. The same people signed the agreement with me to finish the case. And all Howard and Gillet is all of them is the same same as same smell but different color. And trust me, you have to be strong because tomorrow you're going to be your turn. You're not safe to get out of this country. Only people who work in the parliament, they are safe because they work with the government and they are safest way. But we're not safe in this country. We're not safe anymore. We have to stand up for our rights. We have to fight very hard. We have to say now like the other country. We are teaching the other country of the democracy. What is democracy we have? What this man had to be in jail and to be run away and it's the shame of Australia to let the other country to kill him. And he asked for other citizen and he's Australian citizen and other country protect him. Is that shame? It's a shame. Where we are from this way, we have to go there, grab him, bring him here in his home. We're telling the government we're not happy with what you do. We have to be strong. We have to fight for this. Our son or our brother, he's there in England for no reason and accused him as accused. He done whatever he done. It's not true. I'm not believing the government. Whatever they say, whatever they say, they used to call me terrorist. Where I am? I'm here. Why am I not a terrorist anymore? Why they give me my passport? Because I've never been a terrorist. But because they are a terrorist, and they turn over and now they say, I forget about it. Because they are criminal government, we have to watch out. We have to watch ourselves. We have to fight hard for our rights. We have to tell them no. If we don't say no, they're going to keep doing every one of us. We are at risk. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mandu. Next, I'd like to introduce Pip Henman from Stop the Wall. Thank you very much, Mandu. I think we all here absolutely, totally agree with his comments that as Australians we should be accepting and welcoming and we do accept and welcome Julian Assange back to Australia. Yeah. The Australian government does not speak for us and it hasn't spoken for us on the wars, it hasn't spoken for us on refugees and it doesn't speak for us on most issues. We want to stop the war wants to also congratulate the Ecuadorian government for its courageous stand. We know how much pressure that it is coming under. And it stands in such stark contrast to Julia Gillard, Bob Carr's toadying, absolute gutlessness because it refuses to stand up to the US. Cowards! 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 Ecuador is clearly one of the strongest supporters of WikiLeaks and as other speakers have said, there is a reason for that. It's no real surprise because in Ecuador they've had to take on the powerful forces, not just in the media, but in the elites that are still in Ecuador. So President Rafael Correa knows full well what it means to stand up <laughs> to the big powers. And I think we here want to commit ourselves to supporting their stand. Excuse me. Supporting their stand and to do all we can to force the Australian government to bring uh, Assange back. We know that if it wasn't for the Iraq warlocks and the Afghan war diary, our government wouldn't be under the same amount of pressure that we've seen it <coughs> come under.
remove the occupying forces. I mean, it wasn't very long ago when Julia Gillard said, and can you recall this? Oh, Australia's going to keep its troops in Afghanistan for what? Ten more years? I think it was last year when she said that, or the year before. And then the war logs came out. We've got to thank Bradley Manning. We've got to thank all the Bradley Mannings Bradley of the world for delivering that material, <coughs> if in fact he did, for all the people that want us to know the truth. Well, we've seen Julia Gillard's tune has changed since WikiLeaks has published the truth on these wars. The other interesting thing to note is that suddenly we no longer hear about the war on terror or the so-called war on terror. That too has just <coughs> disappeared from the current um, government speak. And I think this has also got to do with WikiLeaks publications of actually what is actually clear, which is that these wars are wars of terror. So for those of us that know that knowledge is power, we have to make sure that we defend WikiLeaks and we defend Julian Assange and we have to keep fighting. And as my voice is <coughs> disappearing, I want to just end on one more thing. There's a lot of legal cases that are going to go on now. There's going to be a lot of challenges like there have been. But we know <coughs> that no law, no ruling is made in a political vacuum. And we have the power to change the context, the political context in which these decisions are getting made. We have a duty and responsibility here to keep the pressure on our government and we know how best to do that. That is to take to the streets to keep the pressure up, we need to have a mass rally very soon to yes. tell Johnny Gillard and Bob Carr yes. exactly what we want them to do. Yes. Thank you. We demand free speech. Hands up, WikiLeaks. 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 Thanks, Pip. I'm, down, I'm now going to call on Anne Pico from from support Sydney support uh, WikiLeaks. Support Assange and WikiLeaks Coalition to wrap up. Look, thank you so much for coming out and standing around in the cold tonight. We didn't really expect to have to pull this off so quickly. We, and I'm amazed how many people have managed to pick up their information and get down here tonight to make it clear to the UK um, consulate and to the powers that be that we are not about to lie down and die in, in, and, and we'll keep on fighting to, to save um, both Julian Assange from imprisonment in that embassy in London and to keep WikiLeaks alive and functioning. Now, I don't think we should see that the fight ends now simply because a political asylum has been granted to Julian Assange. We recognise the danger of the situation given the nature of the threats that have been made by the UK government in an extraordinary attack on diplomatic sanctuary in London. This is without precedent by a British government. It certainly didn't happen when that Chinese dissident was in the, the um, US Embassy in Beijing only six months ago. And yet they can turn around now and suggest that somehow forcible entry into an embassy to remove someone they want to arrest is apparently acceptable. It tells you everything about the colonial attitude which is still absolutely central to the view that the British imperialists as well as the US imperialists have on the view of the world. And we say to that, shame. It also makes absolutely clear that the uh, question of extradition to Sweden is certainly not about questioning about possible sexual assault allegations. Have you ever seen such a performance in such a matter? Something that the average police station would dismiss in a moment. It makes it clear it is not about this. It is on the contrary, it is about getting him to Sweden where they can conduct a temporary extradition process with very little public scrutiny and get him to the United States. They keep asking the question, well, why don't the, the US actually extradite him in Britain? There's a very simple reason for that. 
Extradition is an open court process in Britain. They could not hide the case they are making against WikiLeaks and Julian Assange in a UK court process. This is why they want to do it in Sweden. This is why they want to hide behind the sexual assault allegations. Alex! Exactly. Alex! Nor should we be surprised that the, that the anti suddenly got up when the news of Trump bar went around the Twitterverse as it did last week. When they discovered that um, in the Stratfor emails, another thing that really gave the US government the shits, that Trapwire exists, that it's being used across the globe, that it's being bought by all sorts of governments and instrumentalities, and that this is being used to, to um, exchange information in order, they say, to prevent criminal activity. Well, it doesn't seem to be preventing the criminal activity of our governments around the world. This is a picture of US imperial power that I suspect we really didn't understand or know about. And why do we know about it? Because WikiLeaks, WikiLeaks sprung it. This is why we have to keep Julius and safe, and this is why we have to keep WikiLeaks strong and functioning. We also saw that they were hit by a massive denial of service attack last week. Again, no coincidence. That's why the actions like this are so important to keep the pressure on our governments and to keep the demand, not just to free Julian Assange, but to demand that we have free speech, that we have free press, that we have free publication, because we, the public who fund government, have a right to know. <laughs> our political rights are under attack as they have seldom been in the post-war period. Now, if you, if you don't believe me, have a look at the proposals which are presently being discussed by a joint parliamentary committee in Australia about enhancement of the security and intelligence agency's powers. They are extraordinary. Again, if we do not let governments, we are not going to tolerate this, and this is what we're going to have to put up with. So, actions like today are unbelievably important. Support for our group, support of Sancho and WikiLeaks Coalition, absolutely critical. Our next meeting, next Wednesday, UTS, 6 o'clock. I ask you all to join us because we are going to need to organise more actions like this into the future if we're going to defend Julian Assange, if we're going to get him safely out of the embassy into Ecuador and if we're going to see WikiLeaks continue to function. So please get involved with WikiLeaks and get involved with the support of Assange and WikiLeaks Coalition. Lastly but not least, there is a public meeting at Politics in the Park on the 21st of September at which Cassie Finley from supporters of WikiLeaks and Assange is speaking along with Kelly Tranter, that fearless human rights lawyer from Newcastle. I urge you to come along to that to get more information about what we need to do. But in the end, what is it going to depend upon? It's going to depend upon crowdsourced activity to stop uh, the powers of be seizing our political rights and destroying the political rights of the likes of Julian Assange. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. Continue to spend the word. Take the leaf that I've been handing around about what we can do. I expect that the phone number to the UK um, Embassy in Canberra and the consulate here in Sydney to be harassed with um, everybody calling them over the next few days. Continue to harass our MPs. Make it absolutely clear that thousands upon thousands of people support Julian Assange and that they are on the wrong side of history. Thank you for coming. See you next week. <laughs> Thanks everybody.